this week I've been rolling up my sleeves and playing with these tools. It's pretty amazing. And I've been trying to use them for actual tasks in our companies. What have you uh, learned? What did you do and what have you learned? So I got on the uh, OpenAI plugins. Greg, thank you. Uh, I sent him my email and he, and he got me onto that. And you can connect it to Zapier. So I have two projects I'm working on currently. One of them I was, as, since I'm raised, so raising Launchfront 4 and I'm actually going out to people, not just taking inbound. I was like, hey, can I get the names of all the major LPs and start doing some research there, put in a table, stuff that Sachs did when he did his blog post. But then I started connecting it with finding people's Twitter handles, finding their LinkedIn profiles. And then the next piece I'm working on is automatically following them, DMing them on Twitter, let's say, or following them on and doing an in message saying, hey, we haven't met. Here's the deal memo for my next fund would love to, you know, get together. This is sent from Jason's AI script, I was going to like actually tell them, but here's my real email. If after you read the summary of the next fund, you want to meet. And then I was I'm going to pair that. And, and this is a piece I'm going to probably need a developer to do with our internal LP database to not email people who are already duplicates. And then at, inside with newsletters, I have it building a database of every newsletter we've ever sent the writing style. And then I'm having it go find in real time news stories that we should be including in the newsletters, which I think will make the writers right now a third more productive. But these are things that would cost 40 50 bucks an hour, 30 bucks an hour for you know, college educated Americans and Canadians. And I have already figured out and I'm not a developer anymore, I had to script them. And um, I'm actually thinking about learning to code again, just so I can do this myself. And so on Saturday, I'm going to do a little coding with a friend of mine and, and get back up to speed on that. I think about 30% of what knowledge workers do right now is possible. So I put every single person at both companies on chat GPT four, and this uh, the playground. About 30% of what knowledge workers at both firms can do currently is doable if you can figure out no, and this stuff is not perfectly scripted yet. So I've been doing some stuff in travel as well playing with the kayak interface, Expedia interface, etc. to look at travel planning, and it's pretty good as well. Uh, so it's it, it's this is the real deal, folks, uh, I, I think by the end of this year, 30% of knowledge work could be done by this. And then additionally, on Monday, I went back to work in person. And I went to I hosted our accelerator in person. And then I hosted founder university in person in the city, the city was absolutely dead. But we had 100 people fly in from around the world for our founder university, and a lot of them are working on AI projects. And what's very interesting is like, there's this big debate going on. Friedberg between is this going to be built into chat GPT four or Bard or, you know, Poe or whatever it is? Or should I even bother? So should I bother building, you know, a verticalized app? And it turns out like, I think you should do the verticalized app. And you're going to be able to put together multiple of these AIs that have different specialities. Um, so I I'm super stoked about it. But I do think if you're not using this, if you hear my voice right now, and you're a white collar worker, a knowledge worker, and you're not using this, this year and getting up to speed on it, I think you'll be out of a job within the next two. Jeez, wow. I just don't think you'll compete. It would be like trying to compete without knowing how to use Microsoft Office 20 years ago, right? Like, could you work and not know email? Remember when we came into the workforce 30 years ago, and some people knew office and email and web research, and then other people didn't, those other people retired, they were phased out. If you didn't know how to use a computer and type and use an Excel spreadsheet or do a PowerPoint, you were done. I think there's two possible ways you can interpret what you're saying. So in terms of the economic impact. So one is that you could say, well, AI is going to do 30% of the knowledge work, therefore 30% of the knowledge workers are going to be put out of work. I think that a different way to put it would be every knowledge worker can get 30% more work done. Correct. So if that's the case, then they're more productive. And we we're just talking about the problem of how do you increase real wages in the economy without having inflation? Well, the way to do that is for every worker to be more productive. So if every worker is 30% more productive, in theory, their wages should be able to go up by up to 30%. That's how you get wage growth. Now, maybe there will be some companies that don't need all those employees because now they're able to get, you know, whatever, a third more done. 
but there will be other companies who can hire them. They can go off and do other jobs for other companies, especially when you've got this backlog of, like you said, eight or 10 million new you know, jobs that are unfilled. Yeah, those jobs are all service though. You know, they're not- You're actually more like we're going to have this big group of knowledge workers where there's just nothing for them to do. Oh, no, no. I just don't- I agree with you, but I think there's going to be a group of knowledge workers who do not embrace this and do not make the transition because it, it is, it's going to require- an upscaling. Like, I think you're actually going to need to know how to do some basic programming and coding to really take advantage of these, at least like scripting level stuff. I don't know. It's pretty easy to use. I agree with you. There are writing who- blog posts, but the date, the example I gave of like taking the LP database, sorting it, you know, it's not quite this there. Yet, not but maybe it will be. This is like a chat bot. It, it is. Like, I think it takes like level two programming skills. No, it doesn't. No, you don't have to know how to program. You just have to know how to prompt it in natural language. It's the opposite of need to learn how to code. The thing, uh, about, to, the thing that makes coding yeah. hard is that you have to learn the specific commands. It's like a, its own language. You have to learn a new right. language. With this, you don't. In fact, one of the cool things about some of these uh, OpenAI APIs is that you just tell it what you want it to do. There's not even like a scripting language. A lot of it's in natural language. And that makes it incredibly easy to use, even for developers. So... I don't think this is a hard technology to use. I agree with you. There may be people who are resistant to it because there's always people who are resistant yeah. to change and new technology. And you're right. If they don't adapt, they're going to be dinosaurs. But I don't think this is a hard technology to, to grok how to use and get benefit from. You might be right. I mean, I, right now, it, it's so new that the glue between systems is just not there yet. And maybe you'll be able to talk to ChatGPT4 and it'll connect your database on Notion. It will take a type form and a survey monkey and put it all together and figure that all out for you. Oh, yeah, that's the whole game right now is people connecting all these things. And that and that's what I'm talking about. And like, that's kind of not there yet. But and the auto GPT stuff, you need a developer right now. But anyway, I'm deep in it. And I am more excited right now. This feels to me like 2005 to 2012 period, when you just saw Ajax and the web and speed just all coming together so quickly. And the rapid iteration is just unbelievable. I, I, every day I find a new use for it. I have made my default web page opening. Like when I open a new page on my PC, it just opens ChatGPT4 now, just so I'm forcing myself to use it for every possible task. And the people who work for me, some of them are doing it, most of them are not. And I'm just trying to drag everybody along. And then you have at the same time, th this... Um, a remote work thing happening where salaries I'm finding are starting to normalize not across cities, but across countries. So, you know, hiring somebody in Canada, Estonia, Sao Paulo, and then you add this AI to it, the cost to do things is, this is like, I don't know, I think everything's going to cost about 10, all this knowledge work is going to be 10% as expensive to do. I, I don't think it's 10% less Chamath or the, you know, I think it's like 90%, 10 cents on the dollar. To do knowledge the work. I agree. I agree. And I, I, it's not, this is not a five year, 10 year prediction. This is like five quarter, 10 By quarter. The way, we, we said that the first organizations to use this, like the canary and the coal mine would be the consulting organizations. And today when Harvey got announced, one of the things that, that right on the heels of that Pricewaterhouse Coopers announced like a billion dollar investment into AI. Which makes sense because as a consulting organization full of lawyers and accountants and IT folks, those are the services jobs that you get tremendous leverage if you were to use these tools. Freeberg, any thoughts? I don't know. I mean, I think we kind of beat this horse to death. Right. We've talked about it for a couple of months and I think yeah. we just keep repeating ourselves. Are you doing anything when you're f firsthand? Are you playing with it yourself? Yeah. Freeberg? Look, I, tell us about that. By the way, one thing I will say we all talk about cost reduction and then, oh, you know, knowledge work is dead and we're going to save money and all this stuff. What, what, that is always the first reaction to any new point of leverage realized from some novel technology. The second is suddenly people start doing things that use that leverage to do things that they couldn't have done before. So it's not just about dropping costs. It's about enabling new things that does a hundred times more or were unimaginable things prior. And I think the next phase of this AI shockwave that, that kind of hit us and hit the world and, you know, kind of hit enterprises is going to be the evolution of integrating those tools in a very unique way with other tools to drive very novel 
things forward to create new things, new projects, new progress that was unfathomable before. So it's not just about cost savings, it's going to be about new stuff. I shared a link on Twitter yesterday. There was some guy, I want to quote him correctly. His name is McKay Wrigley. So shout out to McKay. On his Twitter page, it says that he didn't know how to code in 2019. He learned how to code for the first time. He taught himself. And he put together an object recognition tool with chat GPT. I saw this video. It's crazy. With his webcam. And basically, he holds up like a Diet Coke and he's like, you know, tell me how many calories, what is this and how many calories are in it? And it's like, oh, there's no calories in it. It's a Diet Coke. And he does this three different times with three different objects. And he hacked this thing together in a couple of hours. That is a product that was like theoretically unfeasible or, you know, kind of very, very difficult to kind of see how you would put that piece together quickly and easily with one person in a room in a few hours a year ago. And here you see a demo of, of this person who didn't know how to code not too long ago, putting it together and creating this product that would have been such a profound startup. Imagine if you went to VCs 18 months ago and were like, look, I've got this thing and I hold stuff up in front of it and it tells me all about it and it talks to me and I literally use my voice to talk to it. And he basically strung together a text-to-speech, chat GPT, an object recognition tool, all of this stuff completely open source and a, 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 a plugin that does web browsing. And the whole thing is basically like your own interactive visual robot. It's, it's an incredible product demo. And I thought it was so amazing and profound. I'm sure it's a prototype and it's, and it's kind of janky, but it was done in a few hours on almost a no-code basis. It's incredible. So what's going to come from that is a whole set of new products and ideas and things that we are certainly not thinking about today, but in six months is going to become almost mainstay. And many new categories of products, many new industries, many new businesses are going to emerge that we're not even thinking about. So the Luddite argument of, oh, this is going to destroy jobs and destroy the economy and drop costs by 90%, lawyers are going to get cheaper, et cetera, et cetera. I think that doesn't even matter. It's the tip of the iceberg. What's more exciting is all the new evolutionary stuff that's going to hit the market that's really going to transform the things that we can do and that we didn't realize we could do. It's, it's going to be really cool analogy for this because what you're really talking about is more people being able to use tools and be creators and what happened in the 80s and 90s when the nba started playing exhibition games around the world was more people around the world started playing basketball and then you started seeing people like luca or before him yao ming mutumbo you start to have people from around the world who had never been exposed to basketball just incredible porzingis incredible talents emerged because you just had more people playing with the basketball. I think you're gonna have more people playing with code and building products. So you're gonna have incredible amounts of creativity from people who maybe you didn't expect because they didn't go to school for coding or have that opportunity. Hey, um, I mentioned I was in FIDI.